All right. Welcome to this uh, Open Ed Week webinar hosted by eCampus Ontario. Uh, my name is Lillian Hogendorn. I'm the uh, Digital Access and Open Educational Resources Lead at eCampus Ontario. And I'm so excited to be joined by Lauren Anstey and Marnie Seal, um, who are going to have an awesome conversation about uh, librarian and instructional design and educational developer uh, perspectives on open education. Um, before we start, um, a little bit of housekeeping. If, um, if you're not talking, please make sure that your microphone is set to mute. Um, your video is optional, um, but if, if you wanna say hi and, and pop your face on the screen, that's it's totally welcome. Um, if you do have a question, um, I will invite participant questions. You can just type it in the chat. Um, there are uh, participant uh, ways to clap or thumbs up or thumbs down and let us know that you have uh, something to say. Um, and I'll keep an eye on the chat throughout the call. Um, and if you have any technical difficulties, oftentimes they will resolve with Zoom relatively quickly. Um, so I encourage you to just wait a moment, um, then sign back out or sign back in. And if you're still having technical difficulties, you can leave a comment in the chat box and we will do our best to troubleshoot that um, and make sure that you ha can see and hear this webinar. Um, welcome, Rachel. So without further ado, I would love to introduce you to our two excellent speakers. I'm so pleased that you could join us. Lauren Ancy is the uh, is an e-learning and curriculum developer, I think the e-learning and curriculum developer at Western University in the Center for Teaching and Learning. And Marnie Seal is the librarian at Cambrian College. Welcome. <laughs> Um, so just to start out, I would love to hear a little bit about um, Lauren and Marnie, your context, um, what you do and why you're interested in open education work. I don't know if one of you wants to go first. <laughs> go ahead. Lauren's first on the list, but she can go. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I will let you share your screen now, Lauren. Sure. Um, and I, you know, I can go back and forth too, so uh, whatever works, but maybe I'll just start with an introduction pause and then see how we're doing and whether you wanna go back and forth between uh, each of us. So thank you for the introduction. Um, as Lillian said, I am an e-learning um, and curriculum specialist in the Center for Teaching and Learning. There are, uh, there's one other who has, holds the same title as I, um, but a lot of time our work, I would say, is focused on um, many different levels. So maybe e-learning strategy at the institution and, and looking at um, ways in which we can support the institutional strategies that have been uh, decided on. Um, a lot of times program and course design uh, and, and specific oftentimes that's either a blended course or an online course and and then we often are consulting with um, instructors one-on-one -on -one, um, who are looking to integrate technologies into their face-to-face -face classrooms or who maybe um, fit more with that uh, design for online and, and blended courses so open was a natural fit for me, um, I was drawn to it first with just engaging with eCampus Ontario and um, what they started as a as the Open Rangers um, uh, activities, and and I saw that there was really great opportunity to fit um, this open education um, culture into the work that I was doing. So that was really a starting point um, for me. Um, Lillian, did you want me to keep going, or did you want to switch over to? Um, and, and sort of focus on Go for it, you keep, keep talking. <laughs> okay, <laughs> Okay. Um, so I just, I also wanted to clarify too that I, I guess I would align myself more closely with educational developers and the roles that um, you typically see of, of what's described under that professional um, sphere. But I wanted to distinguish uh, and, and maybe show the overlaps between um, educational development and instructional design because I know that the crowd is mixed today. 
So oftentimes what I, I believe I'm doing as an educational developer is maybe more focused on the on course design. Um, but I do get into some of the instructional design and I work very closely with instructional designers who um, overlap with me on um, considerations of design and pedagogy for courses, but then also go on to um, maybe building some materials, constructing um, resources, supporting instructors in the creation of their course materials and, and platforms. So um, I, I am able to speak a little bit to both, but I would say I reside more on the ED side of my, of my role. And I just, I kind of wanted to go through three really quick suggestions in terms of, from my perspective, how I've approached open education um, and, and kind of brought it into my role and, and the work that both I do and I see my colleagues, my instructional design colleagues doing. Um, and I guess the very first thing I could say is, and the suggestion I would give is to fold open education into um, current practices. So um, I started my work maybe in open at more of a strategic level at Western, we struck, um, and with Lily, in, um, she was here at the time, struck um, an open education working group. And we were really focused at reporting uh, recommendations to the Vice Provost academic programs. And so for about a year, I would say I was, I was really focused on like making institutional progress and gains on, on open ed. But of course, a lot of the recommendations that we were able to come out with from that group um, bringing my perspective from my role, I was able to identify some really tangible ways that um, open education could be a part of the things that we already do at our Center for Teaching and Learning. And I would suggest that that's where I've really, since that working group has come to an end, where I've put my focus. So things like thinking about um, open education in context of um, models like constructive alignment that I would use, I use on a, on a daily basis. I think my brain's probably ingrained into this way of thinking. Um, so I see lots of opportunities for open educational um, resources as well as practices to inform um, decisions like the course level learning outcomes or program level learning outcomes. And then the types of resources we're using to create learning activities or to create the assessment structures of our uh, courses and programs. And I would go kind of one step further. I don't regularly use Addy, but I know that it would be a very common and popular model for an instructional design. So I leave that out there as um, a model that, um, you know, for instructional designers to start thinking about how does open education and the, those practices and resources already, you know, sort of fold into these processes like Addy or others, other models of development that you're already using. So, uh, you know, in the design phase and in the development phase, where can open really come into your conversations? I do a lot of presentations, and so I just use those presentations as a showcase for um, open educational resources. And oftentimes that means photographs from places like Unsplash. And I take those little moments and opportunities to be saying, hey, you know, I, this is a, isn't this a beautiful image? Like I got this from Unsplash, um, which happens to be this huge repository of um, Creative Commons and openly licensed images. So just taking those small opportunities. Um, moving on, th my next point would be to connect with the resources and examples um, that you might be able to have at your fingertips for referencing on the fly. Uh, when I speak with people who are maybe more new to open education than I, I find they often want these, you know, concrete examples, tangible, um, you know, to refer to as what's been maybe happening on campus, what are open educational resources, you know, what's an example of that, um, who's engaged in practices, open educational practices, and, and what does, has, how has that changed their teaching, those types of questions, and, and it's taken me a while to feel more confident or comfortable with sharing examples, oftentimes because I'm wrapping my head around um, the complexity of what open educational practices even really looks like. Um, but I'm, I think I'm getting a better hang at uh, being able to reference very quickly on the fly specific places that you can go to find uh, materials like the eCanvas Ontario Open Library, um, like the list that Maureen Glenn um, recently shared with us during a, a session about um, the online course development process. 
Um, so I understand these slides will be shared. These are hyperlinked to those resources if they're, if they're new to you. Um, and then I would just say expand to beyond um, knowing where those resources are in terms of finding open educational resources to then expanding um, this sort of library of examples for yourself and for others when it comes to open educational practices so that when you're consulting, when you're developing resources for courses, um, those things are more quickly on the fly and available to you to incorporate into the conversations that you're having. Um, and, and finally, we can you know, be talking about each of these points later on, and I'm sure they'll come up in what Marnie's saying as, as well. Um, is my last point was really about networking because as I was reflecting on what I've been doing, I've thought, well, a lot of what I have been doing regards to open education um, has been done collaboratively and with the support of other people, um, not only on my camp on my campus, but beyond that. So this was my um, my little constellation of the people and the groups that I've been collaborating with. Um, you know, the closer to the middle of the screen, it's maybe those people, um, groups that I'm um, connecting with more frequently. And then towards the periphery, um, maybe on a less frequent basis, but certainly still incredibly valuable. Um, when we were at a recent Open Rangers event, we were encouraged to think about our constellation of the people who we're connecting with and getting to know, um, who are a bit of our, you know, allies or, or people who can, who, who support the same vision for open education at our campuses as, as we might hold. And, um, and so this was what my constellation was starting to look like. And you see maybe some of my other points um, folded into this. So I've been working at bringing open ed practices into my own teaching. Um, we've replaced out a textbook in favor of open resources this last time around. And then, you know, just a big shout out to eCampus Ontario and the, you know, the Extend community, if that's um, a term that's familiar, familiar to you, or the Open Rangers, all that just being, you know, Ontario wide, but like local at a, you know, beyond your campus, um, some supports, because it's not, sometimes I, I felt like I'm, I'm maybe on my own a little bit, or like I'm the one here on campus that's most passionate. And so it's nice to connect with people off campus who share that same level so that I can then bring that excitement into the, the middle of this constellation, the people who I'm trying to work with on, on a more daily basis to see these um, exciting opportunities move forward on our campuses. But that's really, I think that was it. Um, I just wanted to speak, we're showing, we're doing a showcase, this is something new to us, where we're actually going to have students present um, about the value of open, and I'm finding, um, this is new, so it, it happens on March 26th, we haven't run it yet, but I, I wanted to highlight it as something that is working really well for us to connect, not just with student government, but with the student learners. Um, it's a new uh, approach that I've taken, but I'm finding is really valuable because there are students out on campus that I wasn't aware of, that I didn't know of, who, are ha who can recognize that they're having some sort of open education experience in terms of resources or practices, and it's just really great. So I highlight that as um, a, an opportunity too. But um, I will stop sharing and I think we can continue moving the conversation forward too um, and, and build off of it in great ways. Yeah, so uh, thank you so much, Lauren. That's so interesting and I really appreciate um, you talking a little bit about uh, the, the journey that you've taken and, and the kinds of uh, tips that you have for succeeding. Um, Marnie, same question to you. How tell us a little bit about your job and your context and how you do open ed work. Right. Um, so I joined Cambrian back in 2015. Um, and part of my role um, is not just as a librarian. I'm, I'm the only faculty librarian here. We have a really small team. So it's, it's, it's uh, myself as the faculty librarian. And then I have four full time technicians and two part time technicians with us. So really small team here and so part of my role is not just uh, as a librarian but also kind of the, the copyright point person uh, which I think happens to, uh, to a lot of people working in libraries they tend to be the, the touch point to get some of that information uh, clarified so when I joined it was a, a really interesting time because we were transitioning from having uh, a collective license to uh, 
just falling under fair dealing as the, the Copyright Act had changed here in Canada. Um, so we were working on that on that transition plan, and as I started rolling out some training around that, I started to get a lot of questions from our faculty about what other options were available. You know, I, I want to do more than than what I can do in these fair dealing uh, limits. What what else can I do? Is there is there stuff that's available? And at the time, I didn't know really about open or or how much was out there or or what was going on. Um, and then at the at the College Libraries Ontario, so the provincial level. Um, People started talking about OER and all this, this stuff that was happening with OER. Um, and part of part of that was um, our Learning Portal project, uh, which is a great site. And uh, and I think Lillian has sent you the link to it to share with the group. Um, so so for the Learning Portal site, they wanted to include a toolkit for faculty um, on on how you know what are OER, how to make how to find them, how to make them. Uh, so I got involved with that project as a as a group member. Um, I did the the group chairs and the uh, it's me organization did a lot of the heavy lifting on that, but uh, I did get involved because I wanted to learn more about this uh, because it, it sounded like it was something that could really help uh, our faculty here at at Cambrian. Um, and kind of around the same time as I was getting involved with that, two of my colleagues here at Cambrian got involved with the eCampus Ontario OE Fellows Program. Uh, Laura Tillam and Jess O'Reilly. Uh, so we started having more and more of these conversations about, you know, how can we how can we support this on campus? Um, and again, it was good timing. We had just opened our new teaching and learning innovation hub. So we decided to hold an open day event uh, to kind of get all of our stakeholders familiar with this this concept of open and what is it. Maybe do some some myth busting because I think there were a few misconceptions about what it is and what it means. Um, and, and Lillian has the link there to, uh, to the, the page that we have on it. We presented about, about our open day event at, uh, at TESS back in November. Um, and it was a, a really successful event because it, it got people talking. And then I started to have more and more faculty approach me uh, about curation of open materials. Uh, so that's now become a huge part of my, of my role here in the library is, is assisting with those uh, curation uh, requests, helping people find the resources because there are, you know, it can be overwhelming. It, there are a lot of places to look. Um, but I think it really resonated with our faculty here because they were seeing that, you know, fewer students were buying textbooks. We have a, you know, um, reserve selection of textbooks here in the library and they were extremely popular. Students always fighting over <laughs> who gets the reserve next. So, um, so it really, uh, it really resonated with with everyone, certainly with us and, and with the faculty. Um, and, and now it's, it's become a huge part of my role is talking with faculty about this, explaining open licensing, um, you know, showing them what's available. Um, as it's grown more and more popular, I'm what I'm finding is that I, I'm trying to figure out how to, how can we make it more sustainable, uh, for, especially for smaller institutions like us. So I'm kind of looking at, you know, how does how does my how do how does how does our team prepare for this to support faculty with this? Um, and is there any way that we can be more proactive about it? Um, can we can we integrate looking at at open materials as well as library materials? Because I, I know librarians are always <laughs> always uh, always fighting to get li more library materials incorporated into the curriculum. So you know, can we integrate? open materials and library materials into the course development process or into the program review process at some point to be more proactive um, in, in getting these kinds of requests. Um, so that's kind of where, where my interests lie now and some of the, the thinking that I'm doing on it. Um, it's interesting because um, unlike uh, in Lauren's experience where they actually had a, a formal working group our movement here has been purely grassroots, <laughs> um, unorganized, just my, myself and my colleagues kind of uh, moving this forward and, and seeing where it goes. And that also speaks to what Lauren said about networking and, and, the, and the importance of networking. Um, we've built such a strong relationship between the library and our teaching and learning hub now um, that that's really supported all of this in a good way and, and brought it forward in a, in a, in a wonderful way um, this week we are, of course, celebrating uh, Open Education Week, and uh, we partnered to throw a, a book fair down in the in the hub. So uh, through the library, we ordered uh, several copies of open textbooks. 
so that faculty could see the physical copies and we set it up like scholastic book fair style down in the down in the teaching and learning hub and the conversations that have generated out of that have been absolutely fantastic um i think faculty really appreciate having being able to have that tactile experience to actually flip through the book and go wow this is quality material uh but then also have us there saying you know and it's great you can look at it online you can you can adapt this it's there's so many options here so uh just out of out of this week alone i think we've built even more momentum through that just through those those connections that we've made um and and yeah i'm really excited to see, see how we grow this from the, the grassroots kind of of level it's, it's uh it's been interesting um yeah i i don't know i didn't have much other than that i don't have any slides i just <laughs> just talking yeah <laughs> Thank you so much, Marty. So I have a question for both you and uh, Lauren, and then uh, after after that, we will maybe open it up. Um, but I just wanted to see if you could each talk a little bit about your biggest challenges with uh, find, doing open work on your campus in your respective contexts, and um, what what has challenged you? How have you overcome that or, or maybe not overcome that yet? Sure. Um, I, I, I would say I, it might go back to that um, distinction between the um, grassroots versus the, the, the strategic level action. Um, as we were maybe in that transition period from ending working group and sending this report off to the vice provost academic it felt like we were stalling a little bit while we waited for institutional response to where we should go next with open and um and i think there's a lot of reasons why we haven't necessarily got that really strong and really powerful um, we're going through a lot of administrative change um news from the government has thrown a lot of interesting wrenches at administration and um and so i don't think open is as top of their priority list as it might be for me and so um the biggest challenge was that transition period just thinking how i was feeling a bit maybe um burnt out a little bit think like what am i what am i what do i do next if i don't have strategic guidance and i've just um think I'm overcoming that now and just returning to some some of that grassroots activity and, and maybe being inspired by Marnie and, and others within the community who have kind of shown me the way in in doing more you know grassroots and by that I mean just bringing it into my my daily practices and conversations more than what I was able to when I was giving a lot of my attention to the strategy. Yeah, yeah, and that's and that's interesting because again, I feel like kind of in contrast to Lauren's experience, like we're kind of going in opposite directions where where now we're kind of still in that grassroots phase. And I think maybe one of our challenges is that maybe we would like a little more structure in, in how we do this, um, because like I said, we are getting like an, an overwhelming well, I feel anyway, kind of an overwhelming amount of of requests uh, for help with this. And of course, uh, as a librarian, you know, librarians are always so so keen to help. <laughs> we always want to help, but it's you know, how can we make this sustainable um, going forward as we get more and more into this and I think we, we are thinking about how can we place more structure around that um, and I think another piece maybe not so much a challenge for us but just something that we've been considering very carefully is engaging students we haven't done much of that work yet um, it's mostly we've been working on the, at the faculty level um, but that's I'm kind of interested to see how we move forward with that piece as well we haven't we haven't touched on that too much yet yeah. Great. Thank you, guys. It's really interesting. So what I'd like to do now is to open up questions uh, to our participants. If anyone has any questions, um, please feel free to put them in the chat. Um, and also, uh, Marnie and Lauren this is kind of leading, but um, I know that when you guys were preparing for this, you had a, a long phone conversation and I wanted to give you the opportunity to each ask each other a question, a uh, follow-up question maybe from, from your introduction. Um, so we'll, we'll have a couple of moments to let people think and then we'll just um, go ahead and start asking questions. And, and while you are all thinking, I just want to say Sarah shared in the chat 
a great link to a, a tweet from that book fair. Uh, and I'm just gonna go ahead and share my screen so you can go ahead and see this amazing um, book fair that Marnie was talking about with all of these physical open textbooks. <laughs> yeah, we actually, we even have more more down there now. I had ordered more and they hadn't come in yet. So we've actually, I've actually gone down and added a few more to the, to the stack there. Thanks, Sarah. Wow. So Juliet uh, says, Lauren, can you describe Western's OER working group? Was that an example of strategic guidance from institution? Yeah, um, so we, uh, it started in that the Center for Teaching and Learning met with our colleagues from Western Libraries. I'm situated within the library where we're very, we work very closely together. Um, and we were both feeling like this was probably, I think this was 2017, um, early 2017. And, and so we both knew that open education was, the conversations were starting to happen, but neither of our units felt like we um, had given much time to really digesting it. And um, we approached the vice provost to suggest that we could form a working group. And he was um, very supportive to the point that he, in the end was, you know, we were reporting to him formally as a structure. He didn't strike it and say, you know, go off and do this. Rather, we approached the idea to him and he continued to be supportive of that. So um, we got to, Lillian and I, Lillian was my co-chair because she was in Western libraries at the time in a librarian role. Um, and so it was bringing together the, the CTL and the libraries um, to co-chair. And then our committee was cross-institutional. So um, other members included w, our, our technology services, other members from the library, um, instructors and, and a couple different instructors from different perspectives. Uh, student representation and mostly that was from student government and then we also tried to look at um, a broad staff complement so uh, we had a representation from accessibility from um, the, oh, the bookstore was involved as well and they were um, very happy participants and, and really meaningful contributors to the conversation um, and so we just tried we, we engaged in some community engagement like went out and asked um, people what's what's your understanding beliefs where would you like to see open education head at western and from that tried to pull together um, all these community voices into recommendations so Juliet, i hope that um addresses your question and i guess i the last thing i would say is that the report has been delivered to the vice provost academic and um for now they've been keeping it internal while they go over the many many things we suggested but it was meant to be sort of visioning imagining what the possibilities could be and i think it just struck them as we can't do all of these things that you're proposing um so they just want to find a way to make some strategic decisions but, and then communicate that out in a coordinated way and that's where we're where we're currently at Excellent. So I have another question in the chat that says, can you discuss some other examples of OER other than textbooks or has the main focus for each of you uh, been textbooks on the campus? Um, I think that I, I think we started with textbooks just because it was an easy entry point. Like it's, it's apples to apples. Like you could, you know, swap out a textbook you're currently using with, for, this, uh, for this one that's really available. Um, but we have definitely been talking more about the other OER materials that are available. Um, even, even this week, we did a couple of sessions uh, kind of showing off the you know, OER Commons website where you know, it has those, those filters for different materials. So you can, you can find full courses, you can find assessments, you can find uh, you know, banks of other materials, rubrics, um, things like that. We've been, we've been showing that off a little bit. Um, I lost my train of thought here. <laughs> we, yeah, we, we've been, I, I've also compiled um, a research guide uh, in our LibGuide uh, on our library website um, to help point people to various OER repositories. So I have, I've built in some sections there for, um, you know, textbooks, repositories, images, uh, music clips, uh, that sort of thing to try to help point people to those other open materials that are, that are out there. Um, and and I found that that's been that's been popular and that's been been really helpful. I've heard um, 
I've heard uh, from colleagues at our, our neighboring institutions here in Sudbury that they've been using it to help them uh, remind them where to look for, for other materials. So, um, so yeah, I think it, we just started with textbooks because it was an easy, uh, an easy sell. Uh, and, and I think we're kind of growing it from there. People get more and more interested. I find the students, um, student government has really been um, strong on their advocacy here at Western um, about the textbooks. And so then it's easier for us to talk about, you know, even some of the modules that are available through um, the eCampus Ontario funding that has been developed to, or like MOOCs or course design um, resources to point people to other sources to maybe expand that conversation because they're aware of textbooks. Um, and then we can come in with, hey, there's other things. Um, so the next question is, Lauren, uh, can you say a bit more about how the bookstore contributed and responded to the work of the working group? I think that sometimes there is an assumption that this type of advocacy will not be well received by university bookstores, and that's from Maureen Glenn. Sure, yeah, and I, I would say I sense that as well, that there was almost an unspoken um, assumption that it was, you know, uncomfortable to have the bookstore join us at first because it felt like it was at odds with maybe what they focus on for the majority of their you know revenue streams and and why they're they're here but the bookstore um the two representat representatives that joined us um were in management roles and were able to speak um really eloquently about the ways that um they want to stay in business and they want to do that by serving the students in really um, fundamental ways that support their learning because that's what they've always been about. They, um, I think they were perceiving themselves as, of course, you know, in, rela in a relationship with textbook companies, but mainly their focus is on students and getting resources into the hands of students for their learning. So they were curious as to how there is a shifting movement um, and and maybe they need to be thinking about their longevity in terms of going along with that wave and thinking about how they can ride the, the, the forward part of that wave to be a part of the movement as opposed to in opposition. So they were always really um, articulate about why they were interested in being there and, and having a collaborative conversation about where this was going. So, Lauren, is, is, your, is your bookstore, um, is it like campus run or is it a third party? Yeah, it's campus run. Yeah. Run. Yeah. Yeah, I hear that like the campus run bookstores tend to be um, like very open to that. What what you supposed to? Yeah. Yeah, we see really great opportunities arising. Um, I believe it's at York. And some people might be able to correct me if I'm wrong, but with um, printing and and thinking about how we can how bookstores might be able to be. Um, leveraging some of the open ed stuff, um, promoting that they're saving costs for students and, and focused on bringing those costs down by opening up the options as well. Great. Um, we have a question, another question from Juliet. Marnie, when you work with your curation requests, do you use the OER toolkit as a tool for faculty to refer to, or is it more in the background of your mind? Um, I do. I do often send it to faculty as we're having the conversations. Um, I'll, you know, I'll, I'll send them the toolkit and maybe the link to our research guide uh, as a follow-up to say, okay, you know, if, if you're, you know, I'm going to help you look for this stuff. But as you're, um, you know, as you're thinking about it, here's some, some some tools that you can you can look at and think about, and 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 it might help you to learn more. Um, yeah. Yeah, I definitely, I, I do send it out quite often. <laughs> Thank you, Marnie. I'm just looking at the chat. Okay, um, I have another question. Uh, what do you see as the ideal impact of OER on your work and your unit's work? And then what would you like to see your library or teaching and learning center, uh, I think this in 10 years time? So. You know, what do you envision as the future? Two big questions. <laughs> wow. Um, I think I think one thing would definitely be um, like right now, as I mentioned, uh, our reserve textbook collection is our most popular <laughs> most popular resource because, as I mentioned, students aren't aren't buying the books and they're they're in here um, 
you know, trying to get their hands on, on our reserve coffee. Uh, and they're always upset that they're only allowed to have it for, for two hours and they can't take it out of the library. I we definitely like to see those those kind of stats decrease um, and, and see that those stats maybe be supplemented with more use of our library resources or more use of maybe open uh, resources that we have on, on reserves instead, that, that kind of thing. I'd like to see that, that activity change, I think, um, around where people are, are looking for things. That's, that's kind of the first thing that comes to mind. Because, um, yeah, there's, there, there's nothing, nothing worse than, than having to deal with a, a very stressed out student who, you know, they're, they're waiting for somebody else to return the copy of the book so they can, so they can read that chapter, that sort of thing. Um, yeah, I'd like to have a lot fewer of those interactions and maybe a lot more interactions around, um, you know, how can we support instructors maybe in, in creation of OER uh, and, and having those kinds of conversations instead. Yeah. Um, I would say we have a, um, a program that currently supports instructors to redesign their face to face courses to, full, to, to blended. And it, it was kind of blowing my mind sitting there listening to faculty members of this cohort um, unprovoked mention that they want to incorporate open textbooks into their course or they want to start using OERs to supplement some of the online modules that they are um, looking to create for those blended courses. And um, that's where I would really like to see it go in the future, that whether or not that particular program continues, that um, instructors are, start to just, you know, have these natural, easy conversations about how to, to leverage um, open resources, open platforms, maybe think about open educational assignments and practices, um, because we've just kind of folded it into what we do. So I see the opportunities um, with maybe with those blended course designs as they continue, but I know that we'll be focusing um, more heavily in the future on fully online offerings. And I think that's actually going to open up the opportunities even further because with online design, instructors want to recreate what's possible in the online environment for learning. And, and the more we can say, well, you know, you can build H5P into press books and have this really interactive content uh, that it's, within your LMS and, um, and look, you don't have to create all of this yourselves. We as the you know, instructional designers can take up some of this material that's out there and um, you know, polish it to your context for you. Um, I think that's where hopefully we can, we can head. Great, uh, another question. Are faculty responsible then for maintaining and updating the resources they create, the open textbook, um, or, or do they get a SWF for this time? Oh, SWIFT, sorry. A term to allow faculty time other than teaching. We haven't, we haven't really had things in place yet to go there to answer those questions. Um, I guess there are a couple of examples, like there's a faculty member right here on um, in history who's um, created open resources with some support from eCampus Ontario. Um, and I think he's, yeah, feeling like maybe um, he continues to use that resource in his teaching and through that there's sort of continuous improvement but um it is kind of up to him on his own um in collaboration with his his colleagues um to keep updating that marnie i don't know if you have a sense um yeah i mean i know the uh like the time uh, the time conversation and this and this you know the swift time and all that that's that's definitely come up here um but again, like like you, I, we haven't really uh, we haven't really done much with that yet. Like it's, I, I know people are are interested in in creating, but again, I think it always comes back to that that time issue, and and we're still just kind of starting those discussions and haven't really um, made any any firm directions on it yet. Yeah, yeah. I know oftentimes um, instructional designers are. Um, working on a project with a faculty member and that might be the time that certain um, resources are created uh, or you know built into courses that eventually are going to require 
some sort of update. And I would suggest for educational developers, for instructional designers, having those conversations to, in some way, maybe formally, maybe informally, to make some clear agreements on, um, like this is the creation stage, and then when you come around to needing some updates and fixing, this is what it's what it could look like in terms of my support with to you and with you to do that so that it draws some lines because I know it can expand it can feel like it's really expanding our workload um, to think that we're like forever committed to helping out with not only the creation but maybe the maintenance um, that we don't necessarily have the right structures in place currently um, to be um, seeing how that's going to impact our workload yeah yeah, I think that those are really good points because again, I feel like we're we're both thinking about sustainability of, of this kind of work and yeah, a good way to, to come at it. I think. Yeah, and I see in the chat that James is saying um, formal discussions need to be had about expectations for ongoing living maintenance. And I, I think that's really interesting. And I think that would also be a great question uh, just to plug the rest of our webinar series for tomorrow's webinar on uh, institutional leadership and visioning. Um, and I have a question for, for the two of you <laughs> now. Um, so it's kind of a, this is kind of a selfish question, but if you could dream up any institutional or provincial support for uh, open education work, on your campus, but just one thing: what would you want from from us or from your administrators? <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> I don't want to go with the boring answer, but I I have heard lots of talk of um, on this ongoing maintenance hosting, like having a place to put resources that are created. We don't have solutions for that yet. Um, you know, even textbooks that were originally, or resources that were, modules that were originally created now need new homes. And, and, and I say it's boring, but it, it, like, that's where it takes this intersection between um, institutional strategy and, and maybe some um, funding from outside the institution and, and maybe some work from us um, to find solutions. And we just keep getting asked the question and we don't have an answer. So that's what I'm struggling with currently. Yeah, I agree. We've we've had that come up a bit as well, where you know we've talked about like if you know if we do start making things, where do we house them? <laughs> you know, do, yeah. do we have a repository? Who runs that? Where do we? Yeah, how do we how do we manage that? That's definitely come up here as well. Uh, yeah, any guidance on that would be <laughs> would be handy. <laughs> Yeah, well, we do have an open library uh, run by eCampus Ontario that is now open to host um, many more kinds of digital objects than it was open to host before. But obviously, we're still, uh, and we have press books. Um, but I, I understand that, you know, in academia, sometimes we're thinking at a farther horizon than we are here at, in the nonprofit. And um, so, you know, long, those long-term solutions for hosting and for uh, making things findable are, it's definitely still a conversation that um, we need to have. It's good to hear from you that we're on the right track. <laughs> and I would say maybe, oh, go ahead. I was just saying, it's interesting too, and I don't know if this has come up for you, for you Lauren, but we've talked about like, um, you know, there are some people who would be comfortable sharing things that they've made internally like in-house and there are some that would be comfortable sharing it out and is there some way that we can still house all of that material but make that that separation of availability you know but like when people aren't quite ready to make that jump to fully open yet is there some way to support that mm -hmm. yeah and I think maybe we are able to talk to, you know, our, our greatest need has gone towards this sort of maybe a more technical element because the community beyond, you know, at the, at the individual institutions and then beyond has actually been going so well in supporting um, movement and, you know, driving conversations forward that I take it as a really good sign that maybe we're pinpointing more specific technical needs at this point to support the activities that are starting to happen and the conversations that we're seeing come up as i said it's oftentimes unprovoked which um, i hadn't seen a year ago so um, I, I think that's a, a sign of strength within our 
communities. Awesome. Well, we have about five minutes left. I know we said that we will end at 1250 to give everybody a little bit of, of leeway before whatever comes next. So I wanted to give this opportunity back to you in case you have questions for each other or any uh, summarizing thoughts, summative thoughts. <laughs> I know we touched really well on a lot of like that conversation that you referred to and, and when Marnie and I had a chance to connect before today, um, a lot of our conversation was around those points of institutional leadership and, and grassroots daily activities, um, identifying those opportunities within our roles to be bringing open um, into our daily practices and, and we talked you know, a little bit about feeling like open work is, has been at the side of our desks. But I think the more that we see it as possibly built in, that um, I know I'm feeling like uh, it's maybe not necessarily that that side of feeling on the side of my desk anymore. Yeah, absolutely. Awesome. Well, I want to thank you guys. Oh, yeah. Sarah says, imagine a world where open is built into our work. I appreciate that. <laughs> Um, so I want to thank you guys both so much for participating and remind everybody that this session will be made um, openly available on uh, you YouTube, I believe, um, as soon as we uh, have time to do so after all of the amazing Open Ed Week events. We do have one more webinar coming up tomorrow at noon moderated by Lena Patterson uh, about leadership and institutional strategy and I really encourage you all um, to attend. I think it's going to be an awesome discussion. Um, excellent job Lauren and Marnie um, and would either would you two be willing to uh, field any questions that come up after the fact or awesome. okay yeah so I will also um, uh, find a way to share your contact information or like Twitter or email um, when we post this video. Um, thank you guys so much and have a great rest of your Thursday and Open Education Week. Same, it's been a fun week. I can't believe it's almost the end. <laughs> <laughs>